All right. Well, thank you again to Dr. Solis for inviting me to come back and, and talk to you about my experiences in Nepal. Um, I'm a cardiologist here at the Alberta Heart Institute, University of Alberta, and I've had the opportunity to go to Nepal three times, and that's really been quite an eye-opening experience for me. Before I go any further, can I just ask you, how many of you have uh, worked in a developing country, in a low-income country before? So, yeah, so in addition to Dr. Solas, one other person. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how my experiences in Nepal have um, kind of, obviously here in cardiology here in North America is a very high-tech type of specialty, but in Nepal it's, it's a very different story and the needs of the people there are, um, are very basic. So I'm going to describe life in Nepal as I've observed it during three trips there and the medical needs and the shifting from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. Um, Nepal is quite a poor country. It ranks about 168th on the WHO uh, list of, of countries that are ranked by, um, by income, I guess. So it's, it's a very low income country, much like Sub-Saharan Africa and the use of technology as I observed it in, in Nepal. So first of all, a few uh, words about the geography of Nepal. So Nepal is situated between two giants, between China to the north and India to the south. It's a country of 29 million people, so a little smaller than Canada, but in a much smaller area. And in the north, we have the Himalayas, so very high mountains. Um, eight of the 14 peaks that are over 8,000 meters are situated in the Nepal Himalayas, and the other four being in Pakistan. And then the middle part of the country is called the hills, and that's where Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is situated. And then the Terai, or the plains, is the more arid southern part of Nepal. Uh, the major religion in Nepal is Hindu, although Nepal is where Buddha was born. The language is, there are many different ethnic languages, but the one that's spoken by most people is Nepali. And the currency is the Nepali rupee. So quite a populous country with a challenging geography, landlocked. So 80% of the population of Nepal lives in the country and depends on agriculture. Uh, agriculture accounts for 40% of the GDP. However, a large number of Nepalis at any one time are working outside of the country. 18% uh, of Nepalis are abroad at any one time. A lot of them are working in the Middle East. And remittance from foreign employment is the major income source for Nepal. <coughs> So a larger percentage of Nepalis than Filipinos, for example, are working abroad at any one time. Uh, the population living below the national poverty line, of course, it kind of depends on how you define that, but it was 31% in 2004. And the literacy rate is improving, but uh, in the villages, many people don't continue on beyond elementary school. The literacy rate is about 49%. So a really poor country. Now what attracts people to Nepal are obviously the beautiful mountains, the, the Himalayas. And uh, that's, why many, that's why I went to Nepal initially and many people who want to work in Nepal, many foreign volunteers, come initially because of the very beautiful mountains. There's many peaks there, over 5,000 meters, and uh, trekking is very popular. And one of the things I came to realize is how my own perception, like, obviously I've loved the mountains all my life, well pretty much from the time I was 15 years old, um, but for me the mountains have always been kind of an adventure. You, you go out there for variable lengths of time, like up to three weeks with all our food and, and warm clothing, and then, uh, and, and then you challenge yourself out there and it's, and it's fantastic. But for the people who live in Nepal, it's a very different reality. And I was struck by that once when I was talking to one of the young physicians there who'd worked in western Nepal, a very poor area. 
And I was asking him about the mountains there, and, he, and I said, well, they must have, been, must have been very beautiful. And he just said, well, I was cold and hungry and tired for two months as he was traveling from village to village. So, you know, living in these high mountains and there's villages that, that are scattered throughout the Himalayas is a very different reality than just dropping in to visit like uh, Westerners. Do. So when I, in 2010, I um, went to Nepal for the first time and uh, I went because I had the opportunity to be a part of the International Advisory Board of this medical school in Kathmandu that Dr. Solas has been involved with for more than 10 years. And I also had the opportunity to go trekking there, so it was like two things that came together that finally the time was right for me to go to Nepal. And I went uh, trekking and did a climb in the Hinku Valley, which is just beside the Kumbu Valley. That's very popular. And you know, when, once you're, when you're in a low-income country, you quickly realize that you got no control over a lot of what happens. And the flight from Kathmandu into Lukla, which is the town, the village, where um, the hikes into the Kumbu originate, like the hikes, hikes to Everest Base Camp that are very popular. This is the runway, and uh, you probably heard about in September there was the crash of a plane that was flying from Kathmandu to Lukla. It actually crashed just outside of Kathmandu, but it was heading into Lukla. And uh, you can see how this, this runway is just built on the side of a mountain, so you have to trust that your pilots are going to be able to find the runway and stop before they hit the mountain side at the other end of the runway. And, um, and there's clouds, there's amazing clouds in the Himalayas. And the clouds just move through continuously and uh, you just hope that the visibility will be adequate for the landings, because sometimes it's not. This is probably the world's most dangerous airport with um, many crashes occurring over the years. It's called the Tenzing Hillary Airport because Edmund Hillary put a lot of money into building this airport in Lukla. And Tenzing, of course, was the Sherpa who accompanied him on the first ascent of Everest in 1953. So, you know, this is the village, and it's a very nice village, but I also saw the hospital there. It was a very nice hospital funded by a Swiss non-government organization. But the gates were barricaded because there, no, there was no hospital staff. There was no physician there at the time, and uh, there were no nurses. So, you know, it's, it's great for donors to give money and build things or provide technology, but you really need ongoing support so that people can work there. And, um, and that just wasn't there in Lukla. So the patients would have to be flown out into Kathmandu. And that's about a 30 minute flight. Not a long flight, but it's very weather dependent. And that's one of the things about technology. You can have you know, you're stranded on a mountain or in a village, and uh, even if you can afford the flight out, sometimes the planes can't come in because the weather is just so bad. It's the same as in northern Canada. So then, you know, over two weeks, because you have to acclimatize to the high altitude, over two weeks we trekked over these, uh, these trails, and these trails are really the major highways between villages. In, in the Himalayas. And you can see how the porters are carrying very heavy loads, up to 60 kilograms on these trails. And uh, when one of, our, one of our guides felt unwell and had some chest discomfort, and so he just left us to walk back out over this trail because he had forgotten his heart medications in his village. So, you know, there's just no pharmacies along the way um, people have to walk long distances, and if they're too sick to walk, then they're carried by um, other people in the village. So life is just a whole lot more difficult there. And the porters carry weights of up to 60 kilograms, and uh, they carry it on this headband. So um, they have a strap across the forehead and, that, and they align the weight so that it's pretty much all coming along the spine. 
So it's, uh, it's very difficult to carry a anything like that. And there's a picture of me trying to put on that weight. And these two young girls who are carrying that weight on a regular basis every day are kind of laughing because uh, I was struggling to walk just a few steps with that weight. So these people are accustomed to, um, to great hardships, really. And uh, they look young for many years. And then after they're about 40, they start to look very old. And I noticed that when I was working in the hospital, just because the toll that this type of work takes on your body over the years. We visited a nursing home in, in Kathmandu on one occasion. And uh, the people there had a lot of kyphosis, like just um, from the, the, the vertebrae being compressed by, I'm sure some of them, because of the weights that they carried uh, throughout their life. Another big problem is uh, chronic obstructive lung disease in Nepal. And that's because in these little huts in the villages that they live in these stone huts with usual, usually they just have like tin roofs, um, people have little fires. They're usually dung burning fires. And uh, there's no chimneys. And you can see there is a chimney here, but they, they'll usually block off the chimney because they believe that they have to retain the heat to stay warm because it's obviously pretty cold in the mountains uh, even during the summer. And so they have these little fires inside the hovels and uh, it gets extremely smoky and there's just lots of particulate matter in, in the smoke and when you inhale that over the years that, cause, that damages the lungs just like smoking does and causes chronic obstructive lung disease and that's certainly a, that and then the pollution in, um, in Kathmandu in the larger cities are major causes of chronic obstructive lung disease. So, you know, we think of Nepal and the Him I thought of Nepal as kind of a Shangri-La that would be pure and beautiful, but really it's, um, it's quite a polluted place. And lack of sanitation is another big problem. It's just open defecation in the fields once, uh, once you get into the villages, and most people in Nepal live in villages. So uh, you can't drink from the mountain streams because in addition to human defecation, there's also cattle, a water buffalo, lots of water buffalo that they raise there, and they defecate all over the place. So um, very, very easy to develop dysentery because of the uh, lack of sanitation in Nepal, big problem. And yet, you know, despite all these difficulties, um, the people in Nepal, um, seem to be very accepting of them and seem to, in general, be pretty happy. And what I noticed is that they have very close relationships to each other. There's a physical proximity. That's because they, their small homes are quite crowded and families tend to all live together as they become larger with, through marriages. Um, and, and they just seem, they'll often hold hands walking in the streets, like young men and young women will hold hands. So there's kind of a physical proximity and there's certainly, um, people just seem to thrive on social relationships. So you know, to find your way in Nepal, you can't just use a map or a GPS because the streets have no names. You have to ask a local person about how to get to the place that you want to go to. You're very much interdependent uh, because there really isn't much, there's not, there's not the substrate there for which technology can be uh, used to help you get around. So while I was there, we climbed Mira Peak, which is a pretty high peak by Canadian standards, but a pretty small peak by Nepali standards. Um, it is about 20, 21,000 feet, so it, it's pretty high and you get really short of breath when you're moving at that altitude, and that's uh, just getting close to the summit of Mira Peak, Peak and then right at the top of Mira Peak. And we had great views of, of Everest and the very high peaks in the Kumbu Valley when we were up there. But, you know, there was a lot of opportunity to observe how the reality of the Western tourists was very different from the reality of the local Nepali people. So um, many, many people experience difficulties at altitude and not, not just the problems with low oxygen, but the problems with infections. 
And uh, there was a German trekker uh, who developed really severe gastroenteritis. And once you get sick, like, oh, you just, it's just really hard to, to, to do anything because once, once the, this, this guy was vomiting a lot, so you know, he couldn't keep down any antibiotics. And it's very, you get dehydrated very quickly at altitude because you have to breathe so, so quickly. You have a lot of insensible losses because of uh, increased ventilation. And so he was really dehydrated and in bad shape, uh, but no problem. The helicopter came in to get him as soon as uh, the weather was good enough. And he was evacuated to, um, to a hospital in Kathmandu. But a porter who developed high altitude pulmonary edema at about the same location, um, his friends looked after him, the other porters. Um, now often people who are very sick, they get confused. And he, didn't, he wanted to be left alone at night, so he told his friends just to leave him alone um, in, the, in the little hut where, they were, where the porters were staying. And when his friends came back in the morning, he had died of high altitude pulmonary edema. So that was, um, that was very unfortunate because he was probably the principal bre breadwinner for his family. And it was particularly unfortunate that no one had asked, like us, the foreigners, because our, the British team that was with us had a lot of oxygen with them that they could have given um, this, this porter. Like many foreigners, you know, we initially come to Nepal for the mountains, but you come back again and again because of the people. And the people are just, just kind of a happy disposition in the villages. Um, here's a little boy playing his flute for us, and little kids were always happy to pose. And they're usually just kind of playing around. Uh, the boys play around. The women tend to be working more, and we didn't see that much of the women. Um, they're, they're working, raising the younger children, or working out in the fields. And um, that's, as you can see from the rocks out there, it's pretty hard to eke out um, a living, growing things at this altitude. Potatoes actually grow pretty well at the higher altitudes, and it was the British who introduced potatoes into the um, Himalayan villages. So the first time, you know, I went on the trek, and that was, that was an eye-opening experience, but it was quite nice. The next two times, I stayed in Kathmandu, and Kathmandu is a very congested uh, city uh, with a lot of pollution. So you can see the hills around Kathmandu usually, but you can't see the Himalayan peaks. Um, and it's very noisy and chaotic, and that took some getting used to. The first time I went to Kathmandu, I was really just struck by all the all the garbage that was all over the place. Like, there is some garbage collection, but most of the time people just burn their garbage at the side of the road. So it, it, the air is very polluted in Kathmandu. And so like your, the mucous membranes in your nose get pretty sooty, like really black when you blow your nose. And you can't do any kind of exercise. Like you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to run because you just start coughing. It takes about a week or two when you get back from Kathmandu to stop coughing from chronic bronchitis related to the pollution in the air in Kathmandu. And then there's dogs wandering around and, you know, sacred cows as well and monkeys. And the streets, you know, that's, that's pretty much what they're like. So there's people carrying heavy loads and then there's uh, kids in school uniform going to uh, some of the private schools. There's these small cars, but lots and lots of motorcycles. And it's very chaotic. Like, there's no lines to divide streets up. Like, it's just traffic all over. So you have to be so vigilant when you're crossing the street, because you never know which way a motorcycle might be coming or a car. So I was there for five weeks, both in July 2011 and then September 2012 at the Patton Academy of Health Sciences and I'll tell you a little bit more about this um, new medical school. But this, uh, it's located in Patton, which is like a city adjacent to Kathmandu. And um, in the lower picture there on the right-hand side, you can see Carol Ann Cornea, who was with me. We were teaching in the cardiovascular block. Um, and so we were giving lectures and uh, small group teaching 
uh, problem-based learning, which is really a popular teaching method in medicine nowadays, where you kind of try to solve problems around cases. And I was also doing some echocardiography with the ultrasound machine that they had at the hospital. And you know, it's kind of like the, the equipment is there, but when I was there in July, there was no one who was able to use it. So, you know, I had the opportunity to teach one of the internists there how to do some echocardiography. But everything is kind of, you know, if it happens, it happens, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. People are just accepting that they may not have echocardiography available at certain times of the year because there's no one available to do it. Very, very different from the way we function. And this is my uh, small group learning, problem-based learning group from this year. Um, and, you know, the students are young, these medical students. They come directly from high school. So, you know, the average age is about 19 years. Many of them come from villages, from rural Nepal, because the focus of this medical school is to train physicians for rural Nepal, which is a very underserviced part of Nepal. You know, they're very idealistic, very young, but very keen to, to learn, and they participate so much. I find, like, here, when we do the same problem-based learning, our students, many, well, pretty much all of them have bachelor degrees, and some of them will have masters and PhDs. They're kind of a lot more reticent and don't participate as much, because I think they understand the complexity of um, the problems more so than these students. They're just really eager to, to show their knowledge, I guess. And uh, also, they have amazing powers of memorization. Like, they can quote <laughs> pages out of uh, tech physiology textbooks or pharmacology textbooks, much more so than I'm accustomed to here. So I found it was just really important with that different style of learning to uh, question them more. Um, to make sure that they had a deeper understanding and that they just hadn't memorized the information, but were actually able to use it. Um, another thing about these students is that they were often sick. Like, they're very polite, but they were often sick, uh, like either with respiratory infections or with gastroenteritis. But um, they would always come to class, and sometimes they were very polite. They would. They would need to go to the bathroom, but they would wait. They would wait as long as possible, and then they would ask permission to leave the classroom, and they would just go rushing down the hallway to the to the bathroom. And you'd hear them retching there because you know they were so sick. So it's pretty hard. It's very challenging to be a student in in Nepal because, in addition to like all the infections. You only have electricity for a few hours of the day, especially during the winter months. You can have the electricity for only four or five hours of the day. There's um, brownouts, so there's uh, the electrical grid just isn't available to the whole city all the time. So they'll have certain areas of the city that have electricity at different times of the day. So it's rotating through different areas of Kathmandu. So you have to make sure you plug in all your devices, you know, during that period of time when you do have power available. And uh, most of them will live in residence close by the hospitals, so at least that's not so bad. But we also found, you know, problem-based learning, the way we do it here, requires the ability to access a lot of resources on the internet, usually, or textbooks. And we found that these students, you know, they didn't have reliable internet access. So we found it was really, but they have ways of dealing with <laughs> dealing with the lack of resources. So what they do is, we have a textbook in cardiology that's really useful for medical students, and it costs about sixty-five dollars. Well, these med so we brought a few copies over, and these medical students just take it to the local printer, and they'll make photocopies of the textbook for like less than a dollar. So all at once, there's. 60 copies of this textbook available for the students. And of course, you're not supposed to do that, but there's not much choice in these countries if you want to have access to up-to-date textbooks. So life in Patton was, was pretty simple. Um, we walked to the hospital every day, and we lived um, in, in a flat in this house that you see in the upper left-hand 
corner of the screen. Uh, the middle photograph shows some students from UBC who were with us last summer. And it's really nice to have some, you know, students, Canadian students interacting with the Nepali students because a lot of the issues they face are actually quite similar in terms of medicine. And life is really lived out in the streets in, in Kathmandu. There would often be like wedding parades or different festivities and there would be bands and dancing in the streets. And the water came from these deep wells, like we, we bought bottled water because tap water is totally contaminated in Kathmandu. You can't drink tap water. You can use it for washing clothes, I guess. That's what we used it for. But the rest of the water is bottled water and comes from these deep wells, the groundwater. Um, so usually that's fairly safe, but we still, we still sterilized it with uh, pristine. So it's a very, it's a, to me, when, you know, living in Nepal, I felt like I had gone back in time to the Middle Ages or something. <laughs> it's uh, very disconcerting. It's a very low tech type of uh, lifestyle. And uh, we visited the Heart Institute in Kathmandu. And there, those are some of the cardiologists from the Heart Institute. I did find that professionally, there's quite a bond. Like a cardiologist in Kathmandu talks the same way as a cardiologist in Canada or in the United States. So, so that was nice. Even though, you know, the type of patient they see is quite different. And their healthcare system is basically fee for service. So you only get what you're able to pay for. They don't have the socialized system that we're fortunate to have here in Canada. So uh, just to show you, you know, the high tech medicine that we provide our patients compared to what I saw in Nepal, I'm gonna tell you the story of two different patients. The first is uh, a patient that I followed for many years, a 66-year-old man who was obese and had diabetes and hypertension and high cholesterol, former smoker. When he was 52 years old, he had a large heart attack and he was treated with medication to dissolve clots, streptokinase, and then he had an angioplasty done. But because of the heart attack, he had a decreased heart function, an ejection fraction that was about half of normal. And then as he got older, you know, he had more problems. He had angina and had another angioplasty done when he was 58 years old. And then when he was 60, he developed heart failure because of the large scar in his heart from his heart attack. And he was on a lot of different medications. So, you know, in Canada, we're used to chronic disease management. Our patients take a lot of different medications to prolong their lives and to treat chronic conditions. Whereas in Nepal, people usually only see a doctor when there's an acute problem, like a fractured leg or a high fever. You know, it has to be something very significant. They wouldn't generally take all these medications if they're feeling reasonably well. So my Canadian patient had uh, a defibrillator implanted as well as a sophisticated pacing system to resynchronize cardiac contraction when he was 61 years old. And you know there's problems with all technology, but usually in North America we have ways of dealing with problems. So his device became infected and had to come out, he received a long course of antibiotics, and then a new device was implanted. When he was 65 years old, his heart failure started getting worse and he was in and out of hospital. And then other organs started to fail. He would develop kidney failure uh, intermittently as well, and then persistently. And then when he was 66 years old, he had a, what we call an electrical storm. So recurrent shocks from his device because he had recurrent ventricular tachycardia, very dangerous rhythm that often results in death. So because his heart function was so poor at that time, he was assessed for a heart transplant at the age of 66 years. But he really wasn't a good candidate for transplant. He had two high pressures in his lungs. So he had this very sophisticated assist device implanted. So this is kind of a, a little um, centrifuge that takes some of the work of the heart. It takes blood from the left ventricle and then pumps it back into the aorta but he died a few days afterwards because uh, 
of multi-organ failure. So he had a lot of high-tech interventions done over the years that uh, prolonged his life to a certain degree, got to the age of 66 years. And, uh, you know, eventually death is inevitable, but certainly he lived a lot longer than he would have lived in a low-income country. And then when I was uh, in Nepal, I was just struck by the number of patients with rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is related to it's kind of an autoimmune response to a bacterial infection, a streptococcal infection. And it damages, the autoimmune response damages the heart valves. And you know, here in Canada, I've seen a total of two cases of acute rheumatic fever in like 30 years of practice. And in Nepal, rheumatic fever is very common. And, and young people can have recurrent episodes of rheumatic fever to the point that their valves are destroyed at a young age, like at the age of 18 years. So uh, that was just like so sad to see because this is a totally preventable disease if you have better sanitation and living conditions. But we just don't see rheumatic fever in first world countries usually. So this was a young man that I met uh, at the Heart Institute. He's a charity case, so his family has no money for any kind of intervention or treatment. He, he was admitted to the hospital several times because of heart failure. And uh, he was really, he had a lot of muscle wasting when we saw him because of his severe heart failure. And the reason for his heart failure was severe leakage of one of the valves in his heart from recurrent episodes of rheumatic fever. And the left ventricle, the pumping chamber of the heart, had become really enlarged with decreased function because of the extra work it had to do with the severe leakage of the mitral valve. So he was basically dying of heart failure from a totally preventable condition at the age of 18 years. He had reached the point where a valve replacement was really not an option because his because of his decreased heart function. And he was unlikely to live more than a year or two. So very tragic and certainly not something that we see here. Our patients tend to be a lot older. So the different faces of heart disease. In Nepal, a lot of the patients are young. It's an infection that causes heart failure, rheumatic fever. And the cost of care is really, really cheap. If because you can prevent rheumatic fever with, uh, infection, with injections of penicillin. And in fact, throughout the hospital, well, in the ECG lab of the hospitals that I visited, there was always like a little booth where patients could come every three weeks for an injection of penicillin to prevent recurrent uh, streptococcal infections and rheumatic, episodes of rheumatic fever. So our patients in Canada are old in general by the time they develop heart disease. The problem is more degenerative disease, uh, so coronary artery disease. And the cost of care is expensive. There's medications that you have to take on a regular basis, like cholesterol-lowering medication. And then there's interventions like angioplasty and surgery and defibrillators, heart transplants. So the cost of care gets to be pretty expensive. Canada, you know, we're very fortunate to have one of the best life expectancies in the world here in Canada. And in Nepal, it's, it's much lower. It's improved recently. It used to be like 45 years, and it still is only about 45 to 50 years life expectancy at birth in the villages. But in the cities, it's um, more like 69 years for women, um, their life expectancy at birth. And Nepal really doesn't spend much on, on health care. 5.8% of the GDP compared to about 11% for Canada. Um, most most health care is paid for out of pocket by patients. And most hospitals, many hospitals will have some charity cases. So through donations, they're able to pay for health care of indigenous people who can't afford it. So Nepal has like huge challenges. Medicine you know, the things we do in medicine really aren't terribly useful unless, uh, in terms of chronic diseases, unless there's kind of basic needs that are met in, um, in society. And Nepal really has very unstable governments and rampant corruption. So uh, that makes it 
very difficult for any kind of sustainable healthcare system or infrastructure to develop, to be developed. So lack of reliable infrastructure, electricity is only sometimes a few hours a day, the roads are in horrible shape. Living conditions are very crowded, both in the villages and in the cities, so that makes infections spread very quickly. Poor sanitation, um, you know, unclean water, running water, uh, everything has to be bottled. Uh, poor nutrition, still common, uh, mainly a vegetarian diet and sometimes like in the, in the villages there just isn't enough food, so starvation is still a significant problem. Pollution, so airway diseases are common because of the fires that are used to heat small homes in the villages, large brick, fa brick factories in, in Kathmandu, and then just the exhaust from all the vehicles. Nepal is also very vulnerable to disasters like uh, landslides when the monsoon rains come and it's also an earthquake zone. So, uh, and because, you know, people, there's a lot of people in pretty much every area that's habitable, uh, there's a lot of fatalities when disasters occur. And then there's social and health inequity. There are some wealthier people in Nepal and many poor people with minimal government-sponsored health care. So obviously the, rich the richer people are better looked after.